Hi, welcome back. So we've been so far talking about how to find areas using integrals, and today we're going to start chatting about how we use integrals to find volumes. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like and we'll get into some formulas and do an example. So for now, we are doing an introduction to solids of revolution. Okay, so when we have solids of revolution, this means we're gonna take a shape and revolve it. That's what that revolution is there for. And when we revolve it, we look at the solid created by doing that revolution, and we're gonna to try to find the volume of that. So let me show you what this looks like with a graph. So let me draw some axes here. Let's say we have an x-axis and a y-axis. And let's say we just have some function. I'm gonna draw it as a line, but it could be anything. This is y equals f of x. Okay, so if we look at an interval on this function, so let's say from A to B, we've talked about already that we can find the area of the space made between the function and the horizontal axis by doing an integral. So if I just fill it in here, we know how to find this area now by using an integral. That's sort of what we have defined an integral to do is that it finds the area under the curve. And so we can do this now. But we're going to upgrade this one more level and move into three dimensions by taking this area and revolving it around an axis. So we're going to talk about how to revolve things like in lots of different ways around the x-axis, the y-axis, and then we have multiple methods for finding the volume. But here we're just going to start with a simple example where I'm taking the shape and I'm revolving it around the x-axis. So this can be kind of hard to envision and I'll do my best to draw these three-dimensional shapes as much as I can. So what's happening here is that this gets sort of um, revolved around and it's creating a cone. So you can imagine there's sort of like an uh, the, ba the top of the cone here. And let me just draw it in for you. And then we have that function that sort of comes down and matches on the bottom. So as we revolve around, it's sort of filling in this whole cone shaped item in three dimensions. So if we look at this shape, and now we're trying to figure out how to find the volume of this cone, we can kind of blow it up and look at how we might do that. And sometimes I try to draw these circles, these ovals, and they just don't work. I don't know what it is. So just bear with me as I'm doing that. It's just kind of what's gonna happen, I think. Okay. Almost there, folks. Okay, so this is our cone shaped. And the idea is that instead of taking little rectangles and adding them up, like little slices, we're actually going to take smaller disks and add those up. So we could look at one disk here, and then I'm gonna put this in three dimensions. And so what we're gonna do is take up these little slices and sort of stack them up to make this whole shape. So you can think of like, um, I think of a stack of CDs, because I used to have lots of CDs, so you can think of all of those sort of stacked up, or maybe like slices of bread all put together. We're gonna find the volume of each one of those little slices of bread or of each CD, and then add them all up to fill in this whole shape. So our goal to find the volume is to add up these smaller volumes. And these are, we're calling them disks. Okay, so this is our plan. We're gonna create a general formula for any time we have a function and we're revolving it around an axis and we wanna find the volume of that new three-dimensional solid that is created by revol doing the revolution. So we're learning just one method this time and I'll define it at the end, but here we go. So the task is that we're gonna find the volume of the solid that is created by revolving around this x-axis. So let's look at one of those disks and start to find the volume of it. So if I think of the disk looking at it straight on, it's gonna actually look like a circle and it has some three-dimensional width. Bear with me, my pictures are not fantastic, but I'm doing the best I can. So when we wanna find the volume of this disk, that's our goal. And so what we're going to do, 
just leave that. Let's look at how we would find the area of a circle, and then we just need to make it three-dimensional. So what we do first is I'm going to look at the area of this circle. It has a radius, and that radius is just the distance from the x-axis to the top. So this is just the height of the function. So the radius is just our function. And maybe I'll point at it instead. So the radius of this little disk is our function f of x. And then it has a width, and that width is the tiny little change that we're going to look up. So if you think about our shape here, we're kind of putting in these little disks and adding them all up to fill in this whole shape. Oops, I'm sorry, this should be the whole width. So we're gonna add up all of these little disks to fill the whole thing in. And so each of those is going to have a width of some little itty bitty dx. So this width is dx. Okay, so we have a radius of the circle and then it has a little width that is dx and that's because we're looking at a little change in x on our axis. So we can start with the volume, of, sorry, the area of a circle and then make the volume. So the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. And so now when we're gonna find the volume, I'm thinking of this as a cylinder, but it's really just like a disc since it's so flat. But it is a cylinder since it has some width. This is going to be pi times the radius squared. So we take that circle, the area, and then we just multiply it by that little width to get um, the height of the cylinder or the width of the cylinder. So you can imagine a cylinder, if it was a little bigger, would have sort of a longer width to it. But ours is just really itty bitty and so it just has this little width of dx. Okay, I promise this is going somewhere. This is just to help you maybe understand where the formula comes from and that it comes from adding up these volumes in comparison to how we add up rectangles. Okay, so what we're going to do is take this volume of the little disk and add them all up using an integral. Okay, so we take the integral. Our interval was from a to b, and we're gonna add up these volumes. So it's pi times the radius squared times the width. And so what's left is for us to put this in terms of our actual function that we have. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this. I'm going from a to b, and I have that pi, but my radius now is my function since that the radius of my disk that I'm making is the height of the function. And then the width is just the dx. So that's the little itty bitty width of our disk. And so by doing this, we're adding up a bunch of these volumes of the disks to get the full volume of the solid of revolution. And so this has a special name because it uses disks. We call it the disk method. It's an easy way to remember it. And that's part of the reason why I'm using that word disk so much is because that's the name we give it. So formally, we say that this is the disk method for volume. And it's the volume of a solid of revolution. And it comes from revolving around the x axis. Okay, so whenever we are using um, disks where we are revolving something around the x-axis, we're going to use this formula to find the full volume. So there are other methods we can use. There's washer method and there is shell method. And I have other videos on those concepts. This is just about disk method. And I'm specifically looking here at revolving around the x-axis. The y-axis formula will look really similar, but we do that later. So let's move on to an example. And I've already inserted the images I want here just so that I have them, but let me write out the task we're going to do and then I'll talk about those images. So we are going to find a volume. So 
So we are taking y equals x cubed and revolving it about the y, sorry, about the x axis. And we're doing this from x equals 0 to x equals 2. So I'm giving us just a portion of this that we're going to look at. And let me move it up here so we can look at it a little better. So I've drawn on the left hand side the function. So we have x cubed and our line x equals 2. And so we're taking this area in here and we're revolving it around the x axis to create a shape. So to help us imagine what this solid of revolution looks like, I've done a little bit of graphing for us. So what I've done is sort of rotated this y and x plane down so that now the x comes to the left and the y comes straight forward. That's normally how we do three dimensions, how we graph it. And then I have revolved the shape around and shown sort of what it looks like. So it looks sort of like a funnel or like a horn of some kind when we do this. And so we're going to be finding the volume of this shape of this solid we've created. So just remember here, the idea is that we are adding up a bunch of disks. So my disks, oops, my disks are here and they are going vertically. So we're going to draw these sort of vertical bars to represent our vertical disks. And so inside our circle, which represents our disk or our oval, you can imagine this has some width. Okay, and this little bar that is our bar that we're looking at on our graph, it's sort of like the radius bar of this circle. So let me draw it in. So what we're doing is we're taking this little bar and then we're revolving it around. So it's starting here and then it's sort of revolving down. So you could imagine like a later place, it's sort of revolving, oops, it's revolving down to make this whole shape. So I'm just trying to sort of emphasize how it creates a disc is that we're taking this little portion and just revolving it around and it's swiping this area that creates the disc. So we take the little rectangle, swipe it around, and that makes our disk that we're going to be adding the volumes of. So this has a radius, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then it has a width of dx. So if we look at the rectangle I drew here, you can see that dx is the width, and the height is going to be r, which is our x cubed. So the height is just the up to the function x cubed. Okay, so we can use our formula now to set up the area sorry, to set up the volume. So what I'm going to do is do my x from x equals 0 to x equals 2. So that's where we're kind of swiping the areas from. They start at 0 and go up to 2. And then those slices, we do pi times the radius, that's x cubed squared, and then dx. So we have pi times the radius squared times the width that's our dx. Okay, let me just get some colors in here to help us really see it. So this formula gives us the volumes of these little disks or cylinders, and we're adding them all up using the integral from 0 to 2, each of these little slices. So now that all that's left is just to compute this integral which isn't too bad, it just involves some fractions and things, so let's do that. So we're doing the integral from zero to two, and I'm gonna simplify this. So I have x cubed squared, that's x to the sixth power. So when I do this, I just do some power rule. I add one to the exponent and divide by that new exponent, and I'm evaluating from zero to two. So I have pi times 1 seventh x to the seventh from zero to two. So I'm going to put the 2 in first, then I subtract off what happens when I put the 0 in, which that one's going to go away. So 2 to the 7th is 128, so I have 128 over 7 pi, and then this other term is just 0, since we're doing 0 to the 7th. So my solution for the volume is 128 over 7 pi. And I'll type this in a calculator. I've already done this part. This is approximately 57.45.
Okay, so that is our volume of this solid of revolution that we have found. <laughs> I don't know why I can't get my shapes to work lately. There we go. Okay, so just a note here. Um, this is good. We got a positive answer. So I found my volume. I got a positive value. A good thing to note is that if you're ever doing this and you get a negative solution for your area or your volume, that probably means something went wrong since we can't have negative area or negative volume. So that's a good indicator to go back and check. Okay, so this is it. We found our volume of the solid of revolution. And this is our first method for doing this type of problem by finding volumes using the disk method for volume of a solid of revolution around the x-axis. So in the next video, I talk about how we do this in the y-axis, and then we'll start talking about some other methods to do when we have more complicated volumes. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.